Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about voicing and articulatory phonetics. Let's remember what we've seen so far. In our last videos, we discussed the concepts of place and manner of articulation. We'll turn now to the third crucial feature that we need in order to be able to describe human speech sounds in articulatory terms. And the feature we're looking for is called voicing. Since the word voice is common and used in everyday life, it's useful to distinguish between what we mean when we say, that voice sounds familiar to me, or John Legend has a great voice, and what we mean in linguistics when we say that a consonant sound is voiced. When linguists talk about voicing, they're talking about something very particular. Namely, they're talking about sounds that are made with accompanying vibration of the vocal cords. And when linguists talk about voiceless sounds, they're talking about sounds that are made without vibration of the vocal cords. If you want to get a quick sense of what voicelessness is, just think about whispering. To understand what we mean by talking about consonant sounds being made with vibrating vocal cords, we really need to think about the whole system involved in speech production. When we produce speech, the action really all starts at the lungs. The diaphragm and the rib cage act as a pump. And the air being pumped up from the lungs is the energy source that powers the whole system when we speak. During speech production, this air flows upwards through the trachea to the larynx, where it passes through the glottis and up into the supralaryngeal vocal tract. Voicing is all about what happens when the air passes through the larynx. Here's a view of the larynx when seen from the front. The larynx is important here because it houses the vocal cords. And here's what real life vocal cords look like when looked at from above. Here are the vocal cords. And because we're looking from above, you can actually look down and see the rings of the trachea. Remember also that the space between the vocal cords is called the glottis. Okay then. In this picture, we can see that the vocal cords are spread apart, so the glottis is wide open. And this is a pretty good situation for breathing. But how do we get from this to vibrating vocal cords? Well, the first part of the answer is this. We use the muscles of the larynx to bring the vocal cords together along their length, and we hold them in this position with varying degrees of tension, giving us something like this. If we view things from the front, we can see how the air being pumped up from the lungs will collide with the vocal cords that we're holding together. So what happens is that the pressure from the air pumped up from the lungs is going to push the vocal cords apart. And their elasticity, together with a pressure drop across the larynx, is going to cause them to snap back together. And as long as we can keep pumping up air from the lungs, we can continue to maintain these cycles of opening and closing of the vocal cords. Here's a pretty cool picture of one cycle of vocal cord vibration. We can see the vocal cords together on the left, pushed apart in the middle, and coming back together in the image on the right. When these cycles happen with high frequency, that's voicing. If you find it hard to think about your vocal cords, and let's face it, it is kind of hard to think about our vocal cords, try thinking about lip buzzing. Lip buzzing is the way we make noise at our lips when we play the trumpet. And it can be a useful way of understanding what's going on in voicing. Lip buzzing works like this. First, we press our lips together. We make sure that they're closed tightly at the edges. We put tension on them to hold them together and then we blow air through them with a lot of pressure. This makes the lips vibrate, which gives us the buzzing noise that we subsequently modify with the tube and valves of the trumpet. So instead of buzzing lips, our vocal cords provide the buzzing noise source 
for voicing. And the supralaryngeal vocal tract provides, following up on the analogy, the trumpet. In a nutshell, that's the basics of how voicing works. So how about connecting voicing to specific consonants? Okay, start by putting your hand so that you're touching your throat like the woman is in this picture. Now make the sound S and keep it going. Without moving your tongue at all, change the sound S into a Z. And then alternate between the S and the Z. You should be able to feel the vocal cord vibration turning on and off as you toggle between the Z sound and the S sound. What you're feeling is this. The sound Z is a voiced consonant made with vocal cord vibration. By contrast, S is made with the vocal cords held apart. That is, the glottis is wide open, so there's no vibration. S is voiceless. So what consonants are voiced and what consonants are voiceless? It's maybe helpful to return to the continuum we saw in our presentation on manner of articulation and sonorant consonants. In particular, let's look at the distinction between obstruents and sonorants. English provides a really useful example of voicing in consonants. If we start with the English obstruents, we notice something particularly interesting about them. Remember, the obstruents are the stops, the fricatives, and the affricates. And what's interesting is that they come in voiceless and voiced pairs. So this is basically like a big two-for-one deal. What I mean is that voicing lets us double the number of obstruent consonants we have in English. The only difference between, say, P and B, or between S and Z, is voicing. Sonorant consonants, on the other hand, are a different story. The fact that we call them sonorants is actually a giveaway, because unlike the more constricted obstruents, being voiced is a characteristic property of what it means to be a sonorant sound. So, sonorants are loners in the sense that they don't travel in pairs of voiced and voiceless counterparts, but they're not loners in the sense that, as a group, they're almost always all voiced sounds, as we can see in the example using the English sonorants here. Okay, so let's put everything together and review what we've done. We've discussed the third key concept that we need for the articulatory description of consonants, and that's voicing. We've looked at what voicing is physiologically in terms of vocal cord vibration, and we've seen how consonants can be either voiced or voiceless, depending on whether they're produced with or without, you guessed it, vocal cord vibration. If you've watched these videos in order, your superpower is that you've now got the place, manner, and voicing terms to take on the description of many of the world's consonants. In our next video, we'll begin to turn our attention from the description of sounds to how they behave within and across languages. This is the part of linguistics that we call phonology. All I can say is stay tuned there's lots of action ahead.